talk about the Battle of the Bulge. Perhaps it's uh, part of the war that you've heard of. I know some of my students in the past have even had relatives that they knew about who fought in this battle. So uh, let's find out more about the Battle of the Bulge. The Battle of the Bulge was Germany's last great offensive in World War II. It was the last time that the Germans tried to push forward into either the Russian or the Allied lines and it represented a last-ditch hope on the part of the German high command to convince the Western Allies, the U.S. and the British forces, to accept a peace settlement with Germany uh, better than total surrender. It was clear at this point that there was no hope for any such thing against the Soviet forces, and it was hoped that the Allies who the Germans felt were much more averse to losses and not as determined as the Russians, would be cowed by such a bold and effective offensive and give them more concessions. Probably this would not have happened, but at this point Hitler insisted and uh, was grasping at straws. You can see on the map here that the offensive focuses on reinvading Belgium, actually covering much of the same ground that the Germans had already conquered years earlier in their initial invasion of France in 1940. And Antwerp, as you see there, is a major port town. So if the Allies were to lose Antwerp, it would actually mean that a major port uh, to bring in their forces and supplies would have been lost, and it would have really hampered their forces. So the Germans thought, hey, if we can just punch through and grab that, it will really slow down the Allies. And again, they were hoping maybe make them more willing to negotiate a better peace settlement. The operation in the center was called Wacht am Rhein, named for a song by that name that was a famous and popular patriotic song in Germany, actually coming after World War I. And Hitler had chosen one of his most trusted generals, Sepp Dietrich, to lead the 6th Panzer Army, which was going to be the major spearhead in this advance. This army was to be given the best equipment and included some elite units from the Waffen-SS. You can see on the map here how the German line pushed forward creating a bulge. And when the Allies saw the map, they said, wow, there's a German bulge in the line. Hence, the battle was referred to as the Battle of the Bulge. Two of the uh, elite units were the first SS Panzer Division, Liebstandarte Adolf Hitler, a unit named after Adolf Hitler himself, and the 12th SS Panzer Division, Hitlerjungen. These were elite forces given some of the most advanced German equipment available at the time, and their soldiers had some of the best training and experience of any part of the German military. They were given some of the most advanced equipment. Here on the left we see a late war version of the Panzer IV. In this case it has the upgraded gun and armor, including Skirtsen, which is the armor plate you see sort of hung out over even beyond the track of the tank. And the idea here was that anything that was like a rocket-propelled anti-tank weapon would explode on the Skirtsen and actually do very little damage to the hull of the tank itself. It was a sort of an effective defense used, especially as the Allies began to use rocket weapons like the bazooka. On the right, you can see a mobile artillery based on the chassis of the Panzer IV. So again, they're using sort of adapting equipment uh, with a very heavy howitzer. And this was a way for the German military to have armored and mobile artillery that could move up and keep pace with the Panzers. Perhaps most famously, the Germans used in greater numbers the new Königstiger, or King Tiger, or Tiger II an upgrade of their already massive Tiger tank. This vehicle weighed in at over 60 tons, which was kind of a problem considering that the Germans were short on fuel, and this thing was a gas gu guzzler, and at that weight it was actually too heavy to cross most bridges in Europe, which if you're thinking about advancing an army through Europe and when you then consider how many river crossings that will involve, this might not have been their best move. It was also massively expensive to produce, uh, the equivalent of something like 300,000 American dollars per tank, 
much more expensive than other equipment, certainly much more expensive than the tanks the Americans were using. Nevertheless, these were probably technically the best tanks of the war, and the German hope was that better equipment would offset the disadvantage of having fewer tanks. Here you can see a restored King Tiger. I think this was footage shot a couple of years ago at a demonstration of World War II vehicles. Uh, but this kind of gives you a sense of the mass and power of these vehicles. They made almost 500 of them. And you can imagine how demoralizing it would have been for allied forces to see one of these rumbling at you through the woods. the American Air Force had dominated the skies over Europe by this time, uh, simply by having much larger plane, uh, number of planes available, the Germans could no longer move without thick cloud cover. The German meteorologists identified a period of time, starting in December of 1944, when they anticipated thick and lasting cloud cover. Their predictions were accurate, and the Germans took advantage of the cloud cover to begin their attack. They believed that through quick mechanized advances with their elite forces they could take ground quickly and shock and awe the Allied defenders. They had previously used the similar blitzkrieg tactics in 1940. Probably the major difference would be that in 1940 they had relied on using their air force. In this case they were relying on no air force being involved. The battle began on the 16th of December, 1944, at 5.30 in the morning. The Germans began a 90-minute artillery barrage using over or about 16,000 pieces of artillery across around 80 miles, and then they began to push through. You can see in the upper image here, American GIs surrendering as their forces were overrun, and on the lower picture, you can see German forces rushing past wrecked Allied equipment. On December 17th, one of the most infamous incidents took place, the Malmedy Massacre, in which the Kampfgruppe, or fighting group, led by um, Joaquin Piper, who was a German officer, um, a part of the 6th Panzer Army, had captured some 100 or more American soldiers who had surrendered, and at a crossroads, in the open, near the village of Malmedy, the German forces under Piper's command suddenly mowed down about 85 Ameri 84 American prisoners. Some were able to escape, but 84 were killed in an unprecedented act of violence and atrocity towards surrendered prisoners. Now, Piper had spent a lot of his career on the Eastern Front fighting the Soviet Union, and in the Eastern Front, this type of barbarity was fairly normal. And he represented the ruthless approach to combat that had been cultivated in the East. However, when these sorts of things took place on the Western Front, Americans and British forces were shocked. And actually, later on, uh, Sepp Dietrich and Piper were both charged with war crimes for this incident. So the German units are able to push forward to some of their goals, but ultimately they begin to bog down. Uh, one of the most important areas that they needed to take was this small town of Bastogne, which you can see on the map on the lower left side. And you'll notice that there are a number of roads that all intersect at Bastogne. So this becomes an important place for the Germans to capture if they want to make use of the good roads and continue on their way towards Antwerp. The Allies also need it badly for the same reason. It's going to be one of the major hubs to supply their forces defending against the German attack. At this point, Bastogne is defended by the 101st Airborne Division, which you re may remember was one of the major forces, uh, paratroop forces involved in Operation Market Garden. If you've uh, ever watched the miniseries Band of Brothers, it follows this group uh, 
through a lot of the war and has a number of episodes devoted to the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, you can see these guys who are huddling in the frozen woods. One of the things that the German artillery would do was fire shell bursts in the thick trees over where American soldiers were dug in in foxholes, and this would cause, uh, as, as large artillery shells would explode amongst the trees, amongst the treetops, it would cause like tree shrapnel to rain down on the Americans and it could really pulverize anybody who was exposed. It could also cause trees and branches to fall down on top of foxholes trapping soldiers in their holes. Um, in addition, these soldiers were spending days or weeks at a time outside in the winter. So if you ever spend very much time outside when it's in the dead of winter, it does not take very long to become very uncomfortable. So imagine spending weeks outside without hardly any source of heat. Uh, lighting fires would have been very dangerous for giving away their position. The general of the 101st was asked, or actually the German general demanded of him that he surrender. He was uh, largely surrounded, outnumbered, and famously the American general replies, "Ah, nuts. And this reply quickly gets repeated among the Allied forces and is a great morale booster showing American resolve in the face of overwhelming German force. General Eisenhower needed to formulate a plan to relieve Bastogne and the other areas that were being attacked by the Germans and he called on General Patton who was commanding the American Third Army which at this time was still located in France doing battle there and he asked Patton hey how long would it take you to disengage from the fighting you're already involved with in France rush north to Belgium to Bastogne to relieve the 101st Airborne Division and Patton said, oh, I could probably do it in about 48 hours. Eisenhower's jaw dropped. As it turns out, Patton had anticipated that this need would arise, and before he even set out to meet Eisenhower, had instructed his staff to prepare at least three different contingency plans, um, giving details on how they could disengage, move, move north, and lend support. This was one of the most important uh, and brilliant moves in Patton's career and really showed his brilliance as a commander and the tenacity of the forces under his command. Apparently um, American soldiers on leave in England, even if they weren't part of the Third Army, um, when they were trying to pick up dates in England they would always claim to be part of the Third Army because Patton was such a popular commander and so inspiring. You can see here the soldiers even rode on their tanks, uh, rushing to be the first to relieve the defenders of Bastogne. And here we see Patton reaching the headquarters of the 101st Airborne Division. You can see the general of the 101st there. Patton is uh, the one in the center, his hand over one of his famous revolvers. He always carried a set of, I think they were pearl-handled revolvers, either ivory or pearl-handled. He was a very colorful character. By December 23rd, the weather had cleared enough so that Allied air attacks could recommence. Uh, especially the American forces used the P-47 Thunderbolt pictured here. A very effective uh, ground attack aircraft as well as fighter. It was mounted with eight 50 caliber machine guns, which could wreck your day. And also, as pictured here, was capable of firing rockets that were mounted under the wings of the aircraft. The Germans absolutely feared P-47s, and once they began to operate over the areas where the Germans had advanced, it was pretty much all done for the German advance. So, evaluating the outcome, as far as losses go, this was the most significant battle uh, in terms of losses for the Americans in World War II, certainly in the West. It took the lives of nearly 90,000, or 90,000 includes killed, captured, wounded, uh, but it took nearly 90,000 American soldiers out of action. The British lost 1,400, and the Germans lost somewhere between 63 and 98,000. Now the difference 
is that while the Allies could pretty easily replace their lost soldiers and equipment, the Germans could not. As I said, this was the last offensive that the Germans took, uh, carried out in World War II. And it's only going to be a few more months before Hitler himself is going to be dead. Here we can see some of the footage of the fighting. Uh, pretty incredible to watch. During the bulge, command broke down, supplies broke down, morale broke down, communications broke down, everything broke down. It was every man for himself. We were inadequately clothed. We didn't have rubber overshoes. We didn't have overcoats. We didn't have gloves. We didn't have scarves. My boots were so bad, I would strip newspapers and drapery off of the bombed out houses and wrap my feet in it. You were having trouble breathing because the snow was suffocating you. And consequently, we lost a lot of men who froze to death. You're now ready to take the quiz on this video. Go ahead to the Google Classroom and complete the quiz. And in our next video, we will continue on to the final defeat of Germany and allow us to then move on to see the end of the war in Europe and move towards talking about the end of the war in the Pacific.